Am I projecting? Is this my going? OK. <clears throat> so last year, a developer of Yara used this simple phrase or simple description of Yara. He's, he described Yara as, Yara is to files what Snort is to network traffic. And I think that we can use this to really frame the discussion about Yara and both its limitations and its usefulness. To me, operationalizing Yara means getting the most out of the tool. Uh, so taking indicators from one medium, I assume uh, a lot of us are defenders, and, and using those, operationalizing those indicators over into other mediums, whether it's uh, from network to traffic flows to, and, and expanding the word file to include other uh, network traffic flows, uh, PCAPs, and memory, uh, memory dumps. Oh, and then uh, many, many visualization platforms, which those are becoming more common, uh, offer the ability to utilize your rules. Uh, so either on a specific file types or across all network transactions. And so uh, utilize, using Yara to its, to its most uh, effectively allows us to really um, harness the capabilities of those tools and take you know, one indicator from one thing and deploy it across the enterprise. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, good morning. My name is Chad Robertson. I'm a threat researcher. Um, Yara Exchange, who's a member of Yara Exchange? Awesome. Uh, if you're not a member of Yara Exchange and you like Yara, please uh, check it out. I'll have a, a reference slide at the end. Um, Yara Exchange is a group of, of researchers and, and folks, Yara enthusiasts. Uh, the developer of Yara is also in there that discuss Yara. It's a really great place to get help. So, uh, and we'll, if you just Google for it, it's out there. <clears throat> so, we're really going to talk about two things today. Only 20 minutes. Pretty short. So, um, the two things we're going to talk about. One is what I think is one of the the key uh, ideas, the key principles of Yara that really can help us make right, more effective, and more efficient rules. And then two, we're going to go through a quick malware scenario, just a piece of malware that's, that does some C2 traffic. Um, look at the C2 traffic, take uh, artifacts from the C2 traffic, and then pivot those artifacts to the other mediums, to memory uh, PCAP or a, a memory dump file, and then also to static binary, and see how we can take them. So somebody walks up to us as an instant responder, a defender, and says, here's a PCAP. This, this host was, was infected. Do something with this. Deploy it out. Make the most use of this PCAP. We're going to sort of take a look at that scenario. So we have this PCAP. We know it was evil. We know there was some sort of host that was, uh, that was, that was malicious, uh, that was sourcing this traffic. Um, and then and then um, um, use, utilizing that across across different platforms. So starting with your atoms. <clears throat> so atoms are undivided substrings found in a regular expression or hex string. Uh, with with regard to Yara, so so uh, let's consider the hex string as shown up there. Um, in the above string byte sequences, and we'll go to the next slide. These byte sequences are considered atoms. And so Yara uses these atoms to, when it's going to assess a file for um, applicability, to, uh, to assess a file to, to, to determine, um, to, to scan a file, right? So the, the first one, uh, the atoms are highlighted there. The, 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 more, the most complex atom will be defined or identified, and then that atom will be, will be um, used to scan a file. If that atom is present then, the re present, then the rest of the rule will then be evaluated. And so having a complex atom, at least one, is a really efficient way to create a YAR signature. And so we'll look at sort of how that works. Um, the number one is really great. And then over here, uh, we have net one, two, and three. In that case, it would use one. And I think there's an example of that on the next slide. So here's this uh, uh, file, I think uh, 128 bytes of, of junk data, and then a string that matches this particular regular expression. Um, the the uh, regular expression is, uh, is here. The YAR signature is here. and, and um, the condition is just all of them. And then, of course, it finds it at uh, hex 80. <clears throat> so that's how that might look. Um, and then, so more about your atoms. If, if sometimes a single atom is not enough, in the previous example, ABC, uh, in, like in the previous example, ABC is enough to finding ABC that, uh, but sometimes a single atom isn't enough. 
um, because in this case you have an or. So you have a regular expression, you have ABC and EFG. Um, both atoms would have to be evaluated because they're, um, as you can see, fully evaluated to reg the regular expression whether one of these atoms is found. All right, so here's an atom tree. The regular expression is there at the top. Look at or into this. So we have the and and then the or boolean. Um, in the regular expression, look at into this. You can search for look or search for this or search for both at and into. So which is optimal? So what's an op optimal string, an optimal atom to use for Yara to get the most efficient rule? Uh, the top one's a very poor atom because uh, the quality of atom depends on some characteristics of the atom, including its length, number of, by number of zeros, and the number of unique distinct bytes. Atom 00 is very low quality because it only, it's only two bytes long and both bytes are zeros. Uh, atom 01010101 is better, but still not optimal. And then one, two, three, four would be an optimal atom. That's everything I just said. The worst strings are those that contain no atoms at all. So the regular expression digit followed by something followed by digit would be very poor um, because there's nothing for uh, there's no atom for Yara to identify to then scan around to look around to find uh, if the string matches. And then the bottom one there is also a poor atom. So if you have a regular expression, if you, uh, the, the takeaway from this is if you're writing a Yara rule, try to find something to um, anchor the, the, the string against. Um, pure regular expressions are, are slow. Uh, fastest, so uh, Yara offers, um, Yara offers keywords, ASCII only, ASCII only, uh, wide, um, as well as no case. The, the top three examples are fast because there's only one atom generated for each one. The next two are a little slower because, not slower, it's, it's still fast. Uh, two atoms are generated because you're doing ASCII and wide. And then the third is slow. And this is an interesting case. We never using the no case. And in the past, at times, I'd, I'd used no case kind of as a default because I thought, well, that, that seems like a good idea. It turns out that no case uh, capitalizes each character in the string and then uh, uses that as an ad. It capitalizes just so many atoms are generated because each string, each, each character is capitalized and that becomes an atom across the length of the string with a no case operator, which I mean is valuable, right? In, in some cases, but if, um, if we can avoid that, it would be faster. Network indicators. So this is the malware portion. This is just a screenshot of a PCAP. And um, so this is just a bunch of junk. And this is actually, this is C2 traffic. Um, at the top, we can see something interesting if we looked across multiple, uh, multiple client requests, we would start to see that there's actually commonalities. Um, I've highlighted the commonalities. The uh, 0807 is, is, is interesting, but that's, we'll talk about that in a little while. Um, the, the other string, the, the eight byte string noted there at the bottom is the most interesting. And, and so I put that at the bottom because we're gonna refer to it back, uh, refer back to it many times uh, as a sort of anchor or, or to, um, to, 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 to pivot. So we, we've talked about the, the, the YAR atoms and, then the, and now this is, this is number two. Um, number two being how we can take malware or, or a, a a specific indicator of a PCAP and, and deploy that across multiple um, platforms. So that string will be referred to multiple times. The, um, the top there we can see that, so we wrote a rule. Here's a rule using that string. The string is over there again. And we're just running that against multiple PCAPs. These are uh, four PCAPs that have multiple hits, which multiple hits uh, is sometimes uh, could be multiple requests, or it could be multiple functionality. It could not only be um, the initial C2, but it could be additional um, request. It could be additional communication, not only the initial beacon, but other things that are going on, right? So in each one of these PCAPs, there's an interesting number of, of occurrences of that string. So we're taking the same, so we still have that same string. We found the same string that's interesting, and it's, that's uh, consistent up, up across multiple uh, samples. Um, or multiple PCAPs, which is great. Um, now we can go a little bit further, and this is just really showing a, an additional condition that we can do. I like to try to, whenever I write a YAR rule, I try to do three points of detection because uh, to eliminate false positives or lower the number of false positives. 
And in this case, there are three points of detection. The, um, the string itself, this, the static string is one. The length of the string would be another. And then the length of the file size. In this case, as we saw back there on that, uh, oops, wrong way. Um, on this example, it's a very small file. So we can stay, so if we, we, um, capture the file size, we capture the length of the string, and we capture the content of the string, we can come up with a really great precise rule, which is shown over there on the right. Uh, the, the thing about that is, unless we're looking at flows, so there's the flows, um, and you can use a, you're probably aware, there's a TCP flow, uh, tool that's on, um, that you can get that'll extract the flows from a PCAP. Uh, you can, so we're scanning the PCAPs, they match the demo rule, we can scan the flows, and we have lots of different flows inside those PCAPs that match the demo yard. Because the, um, the, the other, the additional conditions, I mean, the PCAP is too large, so it's not going to fit that, uh, those conditions anymore. But if we do have, back to the network visualization platform, if there's some sort of, sort of tool that you have that, um, visualizes those as unique, the streams or the sessions uniquely, then uh, we could leverage something like that to be more precise across the different PCAPs. Okay, so we have this, we have our YAR rule that we can detect network traffic. Awesome. Um, now how can we do that? How can we take that and detect static binaries? This is a screenshot of immunity. Um, this is an example of this, this particular type of malware. It's, uh, you can see at the bottom, there's in the memory, um, is that string, which I don't have it over there anymore, but, so there's a, um, uh, the Windows function, WSA send, the WinSock function, is being passed, this buffer, this buffer is going out to, um, is being sent. Uh, the, the string there is at the bottom, which is great. So where does, where does that data come from? So it, it gets in a buffer, where does it come from? And, and, and this is sort of a, an, an ideal situation. There's no, op, there's no, um, obfuscation in this particular malware. So there's, it, it's, 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 because it's static, it makes it a little bit easier to see. Um, so this is obviously is ideal. There's no packing. There's no, there's no obfuscation. There's no, so, so anyway, um, we can take a closer look at that. There's the string that we were looking at before. It's in memory. Awesome. So where's it coming from? Here's a shot of IDA. So looking at this sample in IDA, we can see that those strings are, are static within the, within the binary. So again, B11C, 6C, B1, um, and then the opcodes to the left. So, which is really cool. Um, and, and, and useful to us. We can see the, um, the 08007 is up there too, which um, we'll get to that, I think, on a couple more slides. But those strings are, are consistent, and if we, so if we wildcard out the opcodes that are associated with those strings, we should be able to detect multiple, to detect multiple variants of this malware. And let's see if it works, so. There's the rule, there's the, the strings, there's the wildcards. And we have 26 matches. So, so now we have, we've taken a single PCAP. We've identified C2 traffic within a PCAP. Now we've, we've taken that, 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 um, intelligence and written an additional detection. We, we've found that string in, in the static binary. Now we've written an addition, an additional detection, a static detection. And now we have a whole bunch more samples. And if we look at these samples, there's something um, in interesting. We won't dig too much into reversing or the analysis side, but um, if you look at the different functions that contain those strings, there are different um, control characters or sort of operators that are that are happening there at the first. So it's uh, it's either 0807, um, 0A01, or uh, 0A07. Um, so so those those two bytes will will um, prefix the other string, the static string, in in the C2 communication. And so, uh, and those exist in different functions, so it's probably, you know, related to different functionality within a malware. And so, we're still stuck, we're still starting with this single string that we found in the PCAP. Memory side. So now we've, we've taken the PCAP, we've found the string, we've used the string to find a whole bunch more malware in the static side. Um, now if we have a host-based platform, or if we want to use volatility, or dump it or something uh, to get to get memory out, and we're doing volatility analysis, and we're like, oh, let's let's write a YAR for that tool too. Um, we can do the same thing. So we still have the same string, and because the binary is being written in memory, and then it's doing the um, it's writing the, the buffer of of that it's sending out across the wire to memory. Both of those are present there as well. Uh, here is the string, the um, the non wildcarded. So this would be the the network um, side. There's the rule, so there we can see the network rule that we wrote previously uh, applies to the memory. 
and then the static rule with the wildcarded opcodes um, applies to the uh, static detection in the same memory. Get a lap full of water. Excuse me. Is that it? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's really it. Um, the, the, well, there's a couple more slides after this, but um, so we've looked at the, how we can write more efficient rules by using the un by understanding Yara atoms and applying that understanding to writing rules and, and how Yara assesses a, a string. Um, and then we we a second as a second uh, uh, as a secondarily we 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 did the malware we looked at malware looked at a piece of malware we took the 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 pcap and we now have multiple signatures that we can employ across the enterprise from a single pcap um, to operationalize those those um, artifacts, those, in, those indicators. And I, I just wanted to highlight real quick here at the end the new mo the modules that are in um, YAR 3.3. The PE model module is a really awesome. It offers a lot of new functionality and really powerful functionality. The Cuckoo module, um, if supported, allows um, detection for external, like outgoing network traffic. Um, so URLs or those, those kind of things, we can write YAR exp expressions against those. Um, the magic module, the hash module, and the math module. If you haven't played with these yet, they're really cool and they're really um, they're really useful. So um, I encourage you to take a look at those. And then uh, Florian Roth wrote a tool called Yarigen, and um, it's really helpful. It has a, it comes with a database of good strings, and so that's one of the strongest or one of the the difficult things about um, writing Yar detections is is not especially if you have compiler artifacts or .NET artifacts or whatever artifacts you have in an executable. Um, if you try to take a large set of data and, and automatically create a yard your signatures for all those um, all those uh, files, um, a lot of times you'll get the good strings. So this comes with the good strings database to eliminate that that sort of um, generic detection and help avoid false positives. It's uh, if you haven't checked it out, check it out. It's really cool um, and useful. And. <clears throat> Uh, these are the references. The, the YAR Exchange is the group that I mentioned at the, the beginning. Uh, if you're not a member of it, uh, check it out. It's, uh, it's really helpful. It's really active, the, the, the folks there. Um, there's a lot of, of exchanging of ideas and rules, and there's a, a repository for rules. So if you want to uh, grab a bunch of rules and kind of understand how other people do it, there's a lot of really sort of advanced uh, points that are discussed there, so a lot of for loops and conditionals. Um, which I think are, are really helpful in understanding how you can and can do some really cool uh, uh, iterating over strings and such and that kind of thing. Um, there's there's discussions about that, and then these are just the MD5s, and, and and we can I think this will be shared. But um, MD5s of, of these particular malware, if you want to play this malware or sort of follow along um, some of these samples that that detected um, with this with this uh, series of of analysis. Um, I think that's it. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So, I'm. Any, any questions? I, we have. We have some time, so we can chat. If you want to um, talk about Yara, talk about. Yes, sir. What's the fault deposit rate when you're going with the uh, method that you said where you have to read one to the repeated strings? Mm -hmm. What's your false positive rate on that? Uh, on a particular platform, or just in general? In general, um, I think the the most just feedback the the better the better the closer the more static the the longer and the more static the strings are the less false positives, and of course there are there are cases where um, there's a string that's common across multiple binaries that that we would want to avoid. But in this case, when you have a very specific Especially, it's a protocol header, so this is just straight up TCP. In, in this in this particular case, it's not. You're not doing. You're not. There's no HTTP headers. There's no um, you know FTP stuff. So so if you just have um, if you just have straight bytes going to a port, and if you can somehow leverage a tool to look at that in that way, where you're not. And if you can, by, thereby you're eliminating all the HTTP and you're eliminating all the the known stuff. Um, you're looking at this odd traffic that doesn't match anything else that that whatever platform you're using um, sees. 
and then you're also looking for this very static string, then in that case it would be very low false positive. So I guess it really depends on, on just how focused you can apply the rule. If you, if you put this up on VT, um, you know, you might, you might have different results, but um, the, the overall that's, that would be the, um, I, th I think you would, the, if you start adding wild cards in as well, that would be another um, increased uh, way to increase false positives. But, but when you have really static strings, and especially if you start not, uh, doing um, uh, wild carding opcodes or, or looking at more parts of the function if you're doing static detection, and if you, you um, add in different sections of the, of the static binary, that would help decrease false positives too. One minute. One minute. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? It sounds like you're saying that part of the victory, the part of the victory lies in picking target-rich environments and not going for uh, stuff that is unlikely to happen. Like HTTP headers and files and queries that are going to get rid of random frames. Yeah, and I guess that that's really the way, the why you would want to limit the file size to 32 meg or 30, yeah, 30, 32 or or the length to 11. Back on the other um, on those other slides, if if you do that within your YAR expression, then you're going to eliminate a ton of that stuff because all those protocols have a lot of overhead. Um, so just by doing that alone, and you, you, just by doing that alone, you've you've eliminated a lot of tar of of, of uh, uh, targets, and, you know, to, to, to avoid the target-rich environment, you've, you've, you've really sort of focused on what you're looking at. And so the more you can do that, the more you're going to avoid false positives. Okay, thank you very much.